Felix Summerley's Pleasure Excursions. Harrow, on the London and Birmingham Railway, from the Railway Chronicle. This excursion, going and returning, by the Birmingham Railway, requires about three hours from the time of starting from the station. On the return, walking to Willesden, or to Hanwell Station, on the Great Western, will lengthen it to five hours at least. The only visible church, replied Charles II, our monarch par excellence, called Mary, to some divines who were disputing its existence, the only visible church I know of, is to be found at Harrow. The royal wit has a literal physical truth, for Harrow Church certainly stands most visibly on all sides to the counties of Essex and Hartford, Barks and Buckingham, Kent and Surrey, and it is especially manifest to all travellers on the London and Birmingham Railway. On that line Harrow and its neighbourhood, are the first objects occurring out of the metropolis, which deserve an especial pilgrimage to them. The Harrow station is about a mile and a half distant from the church. The walk is an extremely agreeable one across Green Meadow, the ascent being gradual until we reach the foot of the hill, when it becomes very steep. The church is the main feature of the place, as it has been from all time, conferring on it, its name. It is not deficient in interest in itself, and is well worthy of an archaeologist's minute inspection. From all points the church, and the foliage, about and below it, make picturesque combinations, the beauty of which must strike every eye. It is not our vocation to enter very fully upon a topographical history of Harrow or we might give a pretty clear one, at least from the time of our Saxon forefathers. Its name guarantees its age for nine centuries at least, and moreover, Harrow on the Hill is the old descriptive Saxon name, for Church on the Hill. The name was anciently written Herges, probably a derivative of the Saxon Harge, Erge or Erige, which, translated, means church. The antiquity of the spot is further and more precisely vouched for, by that unique record, William the Conqueror's Doomsday Book. In it the manor of Harrow is returned as being held by Archbishop Lanfrain. Notice is made that there was land to seventy ploughs, pasture for the cattle of the village, and pannage, or the right of browsing on acorns, for two thousand hogs. It has too, like many places, its legend connected with Henry VIII, one showing a relation between the sovereign and territorial rights which sounds strange at the present time. Harrow, with other adjacent manors, was granted by Henry VIII to Sir Edward, afterwards Lord North, who of course fell under the king's displeasure at one period. We are informed, said the king, that you have cheated us of certain lands in Middlesex. North humbly denied. How was it then, did we give those lands to you? Your Majesty was, indeed pleased to do so. The ascent to the hill is equally steep on all its sides. From its summit in the churchyard, looking eastward, we may trace the outline of the Knockholt beaches, near Seven Oaks in Kent, the Dome of St. Paul's, and the towers of Westminster Abbey. Southward, uprise in the flat horizon, the towers of Windsor Castle. Lord Byron, who was at school at Harrow, was remarkable for loitering in this spot. In one of his letters, he names a particular spot in the churchyard, near a footpath on the brow of the hill looking towards Windsor, and a tomb under a large tree, bearing the name of Peachy or Peachy, where I used to sit for hours and hours when a boy. And revisiting the place in after years, he sings. Again, I behold where for hours I have pondered. As reclining, at eve, on yon tombstone I lay. Or round the steep, brow off, the churchyard I wandered, to catch the last gleam, of the sun's setting ray. On the north, the views are less extensive, being confined by the wooded hills near Edgware and Whitchurch. It is still a perfect panorama of lovely English scenery, and particularly enjoyable at sunset. The exterior of the church is most picturesque at a distance. At a near view, the details of its ancient features are much concealed by tasteless innovations, and the whole of the outside has been more or less tampered with by churchwardens. A discriminating eye will however, detect in the western doorway some architectural remnants of the building erected eight centuries ago by Archbishop Lanfranc. The Norman pillars, supporting an unusually flat segment of a circle, are still existing. The old Norman font, which was some years since sacrilegiously removed into an adjoining garden, has been restored to the church. The interior of the church is well worth inspecting. It consists of a chancel, nave, and aisles. The old oak carved roof, probably of the 14th century, about which period the greater part of the church was rebuilt, has been suffered to remain intact, and without mutilation. But compo, whitewash, and paint, pews, galleries, 
and other incongruities, have done all the mischief they are capable of, to the picturesque. The corbel heads of the roof, if indeed they may be so called, serving as they do, at the same time for pedestals of statues, are grotesquely carved. The collector of monumental brasses should come prepared with heel ball, or better still, with Richardson's bronze and black paper, which he may procure at Bookseller Bells, 186 Fleet Street, as he will find here some monumental brasses, tolerably perfect. The best specimen, is half hidden by a pew built above it, which ought to be removed. 1. Represents a knight in armour, in the chancel, Sir John Flombar, Lord of the Manor in the reign of Edward III. And the ruined effigies of a priest in pontificalibus belongs to John Burkhead, a rector of Harrow about 1417. The huge wooden lock on the door of the porch at the south, with its massive key, is a curiosity of most durable clumsiness. Above the porch there has been a small chapel, perhaps the chantry founded in 1324 by one de Bois or de Bosco, which retains vestiges of its ancient splendor. Signs of the gilding and color on the ceiling may be traced, and there are the ruins of a niche and canopy, with marks of a crucifix. It is an interesting relic, reminding us that no part of a church in ancient times was suffered to be destitute of its appropriate ornamental character. The bones of the founder of Harrow School, John Lyon, rest in the nave, recorded on a brass. Here lieth buried the body of John Lyon, late of Preston in this parish, yeoman, deceased the eleventh day of October in the year of our Lord 1592, who hath founded a free grammar school in the parish, to have continuance for ever, and for maintenance thereof, and for relief of the poor, and of some poor scholars in the universities, repairing of highways. How strange a legacy to keep railroads in repair would be! And other good and charitable uses, hath made conveyance of lands of good value to a corporation granted for that purpose. Prayers be to the author of all goodness who makes us mindful to follow his good example. A marble tablet has been erected to his memory on the north side of the nave, the inscription of which was furnished by Dr. Parr. On the same side of the church there is a monument in honor of Dr. Drury, who is seated with two of his scholars standing before him, the one being Lord Byron, who has got admittance here, though rejected at Westminster Abbey, and the other his playfellow Sir Robert. Peel. The monument is the work of the younger Westmacott, and would be better suited for the walls of the adjacent school than its present place. It is merely biographical, and, unlike the monuments of old times, has no sentiment of piety at all. Close by the church are the old buildings of the school, which are singularly destitute of any remarkable feature whatever. The principal interest of the place, therefore arises from its association with the scholars it has raised. But these have not been numerous for their celebrity. The most notorious have been Dr. Parr, one of the few learned men, who is always produced to vindicate England's title to knowing something of Latin and Greek. Sheridan, the dun-duping dramatic poet whose school for scandal, a genuine English comedy, is nerveless and inane by the side of Ben Jonson, and Beaumont and Fletcher. Sir Robert Peel, but he being a contemporary cannot and Lord Byron need not be characterized. Byron tells us he was a most unpopular boy at Harrow, always fighting. Very fairly he thought, for he lost only one battle out of seven. There are some picturesque points about the village, where trees, and buildings and blue distances, form pleasant pictures. And the new buildings of the grammar school, appropriately of the Tudor style marking the era of its foundation, may receive a word of commendation. Returning from Harrow, the pedestrian will have a choice of charming meadow walks. One of about six miles, past the little church of Perivale, in a southeastern direction to the Hanwell Station, on the Great Western, where the engineering works of the viaducts over the Brenton High Road are well worthy of a half-hour's examination. Another northeastwards to the Willsdon Station. The course is along a footpath to Wembley, directly opposite the end of Harrow Church. On Wembley Hill, if he be so disposed, he may lunch reasonably in alcoves trellised with ivy, which present during the meal. Magical pictures of distant London, and the soft, blue hills of Surrey. A visit to Wilsdon Church will lengthen the stroll about three miles. The situation is pretty, and the structure, though not very remarkable in any wise, yet has interest enough to reward the toil, for those who care to scrutinize the details of an old country church. The font is early, and one of the best features. A thing substantial enough to defy time for many ages yet to come. The churchyard has the tradition of being the burying place of the notorious Jack Shepherd, and the little cage in the village is said to have imprisoned this genius of highwaymen more than once. Alas! For the romantic sentimentalist, that railways should have deprived the highway of its murders and robberies, and invested the journey from Birmingham with dull security. 
No wills are now made before venturing on a journey to London. Travelers do not hide their gold in their boots, or sew it into the linings of mysterious undergarments. Hounslow Heath has lost its heroes. And a hundred miles journey provokes no preparation, but is undertaken with as cool indifference, as a ride in an omnibus. London, published at the Railway Chronicle. Office. 14 Wellington Street North, Strand. Price. 1D. Printed by James Holmes, 4 Tooks Court, Chancery Lane.